I mean, in the process of the last four and a half years, I've realized that I'm neurodivergent, had no clue about that before. And so when you realize that you're a part of a population, if you're part of an identity that you didn't really even know about, that's a really, it's a really odd experience, um, especially being one who was like immersed in it for decades of like, wow, like how did I not see this in, in myself? All right, Dr. Christina Stye, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, so you're a clinical psychologist and assessor. Uh, you are a, an author, a business owner. For listeners who aren't familiar with you or might not be familiar with you, uh, anything else you want them to know? Uh, well, yeah, that's a pretty good encapsulation. Uh, yeah, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. Um, I do therapy, mostly with kids and teens. They're my jam. Kids are awesome. Uh, and I do assessment as well, uh, diagnostic testing. So um, generally focused more around autism, ADHD, neurodivergence. Um, and I do uh, testing for all all ages. So therapy just with the kids, testing with everybody. Um, yeah, I'm an author. Um, I published a book a couple of years ago. I have a couple of more in the works. Um, and yeah, uh, about five Five years ago, um, switched from a small group practice to opening up my own business, which I co-own with my husband, Josh. Um, so we opened our doors September 2019 and COVID hit about six months later, yeah. had to rework everything, switched to fully telehealth. Um, and we operate the business um, fully telehealth now at, at this point as well. So that's, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. With the with the telehealth, do you feel like it is at the same level as in person? You know, um, I, I do at this point. Now that I've I've been doing it, I mean, I've been purely telehealth for about four and a half years now. So I was a little bit nervous about it at first um, because I just had really never I had never really utilized it um, until I mean, really out of necessity, we had we had to right for a period of yeah. time. I mean, everything was distant and virtual. Um, I've actually found it to be really beneficial in most of the cases. There have been, you know, some situations where it ended up not being really fully appropriate. Um, I think it can be very individualized, but for the, for the most part, when I've been doing telehealth sessions, um, if I'm doing therapy sessions with kids or teens, it's usually in their home and I get a sneak peek kind of into their environment into their personal life, mm. um, which I think, you know, being able to assess somebody from all angles and be able to, it, it's just, it's a window into somebody's life that I wouldn't normally get to see if they're coming into an office setting, they're in my atmosphere, my space, um, versus me getting to be in their space and kind of getting a feel for how day-to-day -day life looks for them. So it's been really great, especially for um, if I'm doing an assessment for a, a young child in particular, being able to have more of those natural behavioral observations has been really, really awesome hmm. um, and really beneficial. So I actually tend to prefer it now. I mean, I think um, long-term, the goal would be to probably be more hybrid and do some in-person and some uh, virtual but I, I feel like at this point, I would really incorporate telehealth into an aspect of all of my assessments because that natural observation into a person's home and their personal life is just, I get a lot of really good data and information in there. So, plus I've gotten to meet everybody's pets, <laughs> which <laughs> has been probably the funnest thing for me because I love animals and um, and everyone gets really excited to like show me their pets. So that's a good way to connect with children, especially too. Um, and honestly with adults, like for the first time, if I'm meeting somebody to be like, oh, you got a pet? Like, nah. show me, like, what are their names? And um, so that's been a good icebreaker for a lot of um, the people that I work with too. Yeah. I, I rarely have my pets down here, my dogs, because they get a little, little yappy at times and they can be a little hard to shut up because yeah, that's just how they are. Yeah, so that's why I'm in my basement. My dogs are on the main floor. Hopefully they will. I've got like, I've got Spotify on with like calming music and like the yeah. window shades down. Yeah, they're not allowed down here when I'm working because yeah, yeah they would be loud. 
Yeah, I wish I could have them down here though, because I love showing off my dogs, and I they're they're my family, so I, I do enjoy having them around. But I just can't predict what they'll bark at because I don't hear anything, and they start going off. So. Yes, same. <laughs> Um, how many dogs do you have? I've got two, a boxer and a beagle. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. They're pretty um, cute. I like them. <laughs> yeah. So uh, with telehealth, are there any things that are missing from being telehealth? Like, are there any or are there certain situations that are more beneficial for being in person at all? Yeah. Well, so from from an assessment standpoint, um, so for some of the, for young kids and particular, it, there are certain aspects of assessment that can be a little bit more challenging. Um, a lot of the assessments available for really young kids, there's a lot of um, very like, there's a lot of tangibles, like a lot of hands-on like materials and, and things like that, that you just can't necessarily replicate yeah. um, over a telehealth platform. So um, like one of the main cognitive tests that I used to do for the little littles, I I, I can't do, there's not a good way to do that. It, over telehealth. So I, um, unfortunately, I just can't do cognitive testing for the really mm. little kids, but um, anyone six and up, um, uh, yeah, any kids six and up is pretty easy to do everything for. I have still been able to do, I would say, pretty comprehensive autism evaluations um, for the young kids. There's certain um, things from certain assessments that I just, I, I can't do. Again, there's like really specific materials and things that a lot of the assessments require. Um, so in all honesty, a lot of those assessments are ones that I don't particularly like. They're very rigid yeah. <laughs> from my perspective. So I like the ability to be a little bit more flexible. So s sometimes um, if there's a kid that's like really um, active, like energetically active, that can be hard if they're not like able to sit still long enough just to even really like engage with me interacting with somebody over a computer for a very young child is just not as tangible as working with somebody in person. So in some situations, I would say for like really young kids, um, it might not necessarily be appropriate. But I've really, I've really only maybe referred out one or two people that I can think of, um, where I it just really wasn't appropriate. And one was a kid very, very sweet, but he, he could not stop looking at himself in the, in the camera. Mm. And he was smart right. enough to know I had his parents turn off the self view. You can do that, but he would turn it back on because he was just so like infatuated with like looking at his face on camera, which was so cute. But then he's literally just like making faces at himself the entire time. <laughs> like he couldn't, like he just could not, he could not not do it. And I'd be trying to like ask questions and he was like not hearing anything that I said. So for him, I'm like, yeah, he needs to be somewhere where, <laughs> where he can't be like looking at himself. No. Um, so that was one, that was one just very rare situation, but I really haven't outside of a few assessment measures here and there, I really haven't been able to, I haven't really found any, like any situations where um, it would be like very wildly inappropriate. Yeah. So yeah, in, in most of most of the cases, I actually find it to be really, really beneficial. And I actually think the the um the accessibility piece has been one of the the biggest benefits. So I live in the state of Iowa. It's very rural. Yeah. And so uh there's there's pockets of of cities and, but that's where like a lot of the mental health services are centered, right? So uh, Des Moines, the capital is like very big and that's where like a lot of service, I mean, services in general, but mental health services tend to be clustered there. Um, same with um, the Iowa city area, um, a big cluster of, of services there. And then really like, and then a few others here and there in, in other larger cities, but there's these huge pockets in between that are very rural. And, um, you know, before telehealth was really a thing, it, I mean, people would be driving hours to come yeah. for, I mean, even I, I had a, a therapy client that would drive an hour and a half one way, do an hour of therapy session with me, drive an hour and a half back. So he was spending three hours on the road plus yeah. an hour of therapy. So, um, and that was just 
for a lot of people, I mean, they did it, but that's just really not accessible for a lot of people um, if they even have transportation. So I've really found that telehealth has been, um, it's really opened up the accessibility. I, I can see people from all over the state and I, and I do. Um, I live in Southeast Iowa and I have people from all over the state that are able to see me, which yeah. especially from an assessment standpoint, being able to offer assessment services is really big because there are not a lot of, not a lot of psychologists in Iowa to begin with, but also not a lot of testing psychologists. So being able to put that accessibility out there. Yeah, I've really found there to be a lot more pros than cons. I mean, my, my practice has been very busy and very full. Um, I've had to do really hardly any marketing. Um, yeah. And then the referrals kind of just come in from other referrals. So yeah, it's been, it's been awesome, yeah. honestly. You know, I feel like that's one of the, I don't think there were a ton of great things to come out of COVID, but the the push with technology for like virtual meetings and, and mm -hmm. telehealth, I know telehealth was already present before COVID, but I just feel like a lot of resources went into development. Yeah. Like the technology we're using right now was not really up to par um, in 2020 like it just wasn't there yet no. like you could do <laughs> you could do audio but like you know zoom was already a thing but you can't with zoom it's not lossless audio so if there's a glitch in it you're still gonna get that in the final recording and i was i did podcast for a short minute uh in 2020 and it was uh the product i used only had audio so like we i would be able to see my guest, but there was no video recording. Like it just wasn't there yet. Mm -hmm. And now, now there's a Riverside, which I use, and then there's a bunch of other options too. So it's pretty cool that, that has progressed so much in just a short time because of COVID. But so yeah, yeah. that's probably one really good thing. I agree. I, 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 I call it a silver lining. Um, and yeah. it definitely has shifted the way that I've, that I operate my practice. I don't know that I would have I don't know that I would have thought about the accessibility feature of it, honestly, like if it hadn't been for COVID, because yeah. um, it really wasn't until then. And, and then realizing like, oh, my gosh, like I'm getting people from everywhere. Yeah. And then like places that I and I'm not a, I'm not an Iowa native. So I was getting people from like places I'm like, I don't even know where that is in Iowa. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, gosh, like it's like a very small town or it's very rural. Um, and I, I guess the one thing just with the accessibility is if people don't have access to the Internet. I mean, that that's that's an issue, right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, for the accessibility standpoint, but really, I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't had very many issues with that. Um, yeah. so yeah, it's been really, it's helped me cast my net very wide and I, it makes me think differently about it now, that accessibility piece for sure. Yeah. I interviewed, uh, an, another, she, she's a coach technically, but she's, uh, does, research. Uh, she's a researcher. So she's got her doctorate, but Dr. Mm -hmm. Sarah Wayland, um, and she, I read her book, Is This Autism? Like it's a book for clinicians and uh, yes, Yeah, that is awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she, I mean, in her book, she mentioned that like people are like, you go to a lot of psychologists and people are not comfortable uh, diagnosing autism. And, mm -hmm. and this is probably one of the reasons that it's so underdiagnosed. Like there's a lot more autistic people and then uh, the numbers would indicate if you just, you know, tallied up the number of people who are diagnosed with it. Sure. So what is the reason for that? Like, why do, why are so many people uncomfortable diagnosing? Like, what's the, is it because of it, it being a spectrum and being so, is it just elusive? Yeah, that's a great question. First of all, I will give a plug for that book too. I think that's a great book. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I, I would encourage any, um, any assessor to read that. Um, and she has two different versions, I think, of it, of it too. Like there's one geared more yeah. towards clinicians and then one more for like, I don't know, just like the com like common, like lay person. Um, but I think that that's a really good, I think that that's a really good, um, resource for people to use. Um, I think that so from from my experience, um, I'm I'm in my late 30s. I, I got my doctorate about um, about 10 years ago. Um, 
And so just to give a little bit of context, because things maybe have shifted a a little bit um, in that time. But I think one of the biggest barriers that um, that assessors and psychologists feel when it comes to uh, assessing for and diagnosing autism is there really um, isn't a lot of education that we get around it. So, I mean, outside of uh, learning the diet, like learning the DSM, the diagnostic manual, which I don't have down here with me, but it's like, it's like the psychologist Bible. It's a very, very yeah. thick book. Mine is literally falling apart because they've used it so much. Um, so we, we, you know, we learned about the, you know, various diagnoses and, and things like that. But, um, at least in my program, there was very little time spent on, um, well, very little time spent just in general with like a very specific diagnosis, but we didn't talk a lot about neurodivergence. We didn't talk a lot um, specifically about autism. And so I think that that is part of it is that there isn't generally enough training or education around it, unless that's really kind of an area where you tailor your experience. But I will say even for me, because I did tailor my experience in that direction, um, because I've I've always loved working with kids. I've always loved working um, with kids with uh, developmental disabilities. I mean, from the time that I was very, very young. Yeah. So I I've had I've been working with the autistic population for like most of my life at this point. And even with that, even with working with a lot of kids, working with a lot of autistic kids, there's, um, the spectrum is very wide and most people are very, um, even psychologists and, and therapists and mental health providers are really not, um, very, they're not formally trained around like how diverse that spectrum can look. And so what we tend to be taught, even in our educational systems is the the stereotype um the and i would say like the more overt or very kind of like obvious autism so which tends to be those with um higher support needs um if they're if those that have maybe like an accompanying intellectual disability or um an accompanying um speech delay or somebody who's not speaking things that tend to be a little bit more obvious um I think people feel a little bit more comfortable with, but the nuance of autism um, is not something that is that it, at least at the time that I was in school, it was not taught. And to be fair, I mean, like the professors and everybody teaching these classes, they, they weren't taught it either. Yeah. So um, it really took, uh, it has taken from my perspective, um, a lot of advocacy work from the um, from the neurodivergent community, from the autistic community, from the ADHD community, from those with learning disabilities, those who have lived experience of really being able to kind of come out and advocate and talk about their experiences. Um, so I think the direction that I see with assessors is they either tend to be they don't want to do assessments at all because they don't they just with the spectrum, they just don't feel like they know how to really appropriately distinguish, you know, what, what's on the spectrum, what's not. Um, the other direction that I see assessors go is being so rigid with the diagnostic criteria for autism that they miss a lot of the autistic cases for individuals who have lower support needs for those who are higher masking for those who are women or female or girls. Um, and, um, because there's just a rigidity around the diagnostic criteria. So I think those are some of the the main points. And, um, it's interesting because the diagnostic manual certainly has its flaws. I'm not like a huge fan of it and all of its components, but if you really look through it and read it, uh, under the diagnostic criteria for autism, it's actually very fluid mm-hmm. <laughs> if you're reading it that way. Um, but people get very stuck and very rigid in these very specific criteria that even in the manual itself, it really doesn't say it has to be this very specific thing. It's actually more like, hey, here's an example of this. This is not an exhaustive list. These are some things that you know might might be present, might not be present. Um, so, but yeah, I think for a lot of those reasons that there 
tends to be um, a lot of hesitation from assessors, you know, for that reason. Yeah. Well, it seems like the conversation, even in the general public, can be kind of hard because there's a. I think people want to be able to just kind of label something or characterize something simply and not, and then not think about it like, oh, this is what autism is and not think mm -hmm. about it too much. And it can be a negative, even when somebody's trying to be a positive about it. Like mm -hmm. people will call it a superpower and that can alienate people who are more dependent and have more needs that, uh, with it. And, and, and it can be more of a disability for some. But some people, they want to say, well, they want to put it in a positive light, which is, they mean well, I think. But then, mm -hmm. you know, it, by calling it a superpower, it kind of, it, it brushes over the needs that some autistic people have. Would that be right? Yeah, I think that that's, that's where I feel like a lot of people have issue with it. Um, that, you know, and I've seen... It's been really interesting to watch how social media has really shifted over the last, even like the last two, two years, two to three years. Um, because when I kind of came into more of the like autism awareness, advocacy and self-advocacy circle, um, because in the, I mean, in the process of the last four and a half years, I've realized that I'm neurodivergent, had no clue about that before. Hmm. And so when you realize that you're a part of a, a population, if you're part of an identity that you didn't really even know about, that's a really, it's a really odd experience, um, especially being one who was like immersed in it for decades of like, wow, like, how did I not see this in, in myself? But so watching kind of the advocacy movement how I saw it, and this was just my perspective of it, um, that there was a lot of um, a lot of positivity thrown towards it. Of you know, we're, you know, we're not we're not disordered. We're just different. Mm -hmm. I heard a lot of that language. People very, being very negative about the words disorder or deficit. Um, some people even taking offense to the word disability. That shifted now a little bit. Now disability is okay, but some of the other D words are not okay. Um, and there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of policing over language I've, I've noticed. Um, but where my concern comes in with that is if we're going to be shifting everything to be so, um, yeah, uh, we're just different. Autism's great. ADHD yeah. is great. Learning disabilities are great. We're just different. Our brains just think differently. It yes, I think that there does need to be more acceptance around that and more acceptance around, hey, like, you know, there are people that exist that have different brains and these brains can be really cool and can be really creative and can think of, you know, be very outside of the box thinkers. But if we just focus on how awesome our brains are or that it, we just call it a difference, it really negates the very real need that a lot of people have um, around accommodations. Um, and for many, it, it is very disabling. And so I've had concern with getting too like positive and like cheerleadery around neurodivergence. I agree. I think people mean well. Um, but even I've seen this even within like the actually autistic community. So those with lived experience with, you know, the, who are autistic of being driving the point home so much that like, no, like we're just different. We're just different, you know, where I would say, and this is just my experience, you know, my, my autism it is disabling for me mm. in, in, I can think of many situations where it's been very disabling. It isn't in all contexts and it isn't in every situation. Um, but to, to just kind of be like, oh no, it's okay. Like you're just different. To yeah. me, really negates the very real need that a lot of autistic individuals have, or I mean, any anyone with a with a neurodivergent brain, or anyone with any diagnosis. You know, if we just were to say, "Oh no, it's okay," like somebody with really crippling anxiety, just to be like, "Oh no, it's okay," <laughs> like you just think differently. Yeah. Well, for somebody with crippling anxiety, like for them, that's it's, it's no, like I am not able to do certain things because of the way that my brain is working. And that's a problem for me. Yeah. Well, I, 
I grew up in the nineties and so I'm probably pretty close to the same age as you. I'm 39, um, might be a little bit older, but, um, I grew up in the nineties and I went to a private school and I probably have ADHD. I don't think I've been formally diagnosed with it, Mm -hmm. but in the nineties they wanted to, it was kind of like a band aid. uh, what they wanted to do with everyone. It was just mm-hmm. give them medication, give them medication, don't think about it again. And uh, I don't think that's the right model either because it's like we all have different needs and mm-hmm. I don't, some of these medications are, you know, pretty strong too. Yeah. So it's like if you can find a way to handle it without the medication and and adapt a bit, I think that's ideal. But I don't, think it was really common to address it without medication in the 90s mm-hmm. like to find different ways and um yeah it's just it's been a interesting road like interesting path journey uh dealing with it because you do have different needs you do have it's a little bit different um and there are certain things that are a benefit like the being hyper focused when something's really interesting that's great although it can be a problem at times too. Like sure. there, are different things, <laughs> there are different things that are uh, you have to deal with, but yeah, I. It's interesting because like the classroom setting and the work setting, like all of these things are. I think they're kind of bad for everybody. Like mm-hmm. going to school for eight eight hours a day, five days a week, sitting in a classroom, especially when you're younger, and you want to just be outside playing or something like that. I just don't think it's conducive to development as a child. But yeah. then, you know, it's it's like our, our whole lives are kind of structured around that, you know, nine to five kind of setting. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's not conducive to, especially some people. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, I think that that's a big piece of it. It's, it's, it's a really good point. I think... Um, a lot of the accommodations that I've seen for um, so for my neurodivergent um, kiddos, especially if they're getting accommodations in school, are generally a, a lot of times a teacher will make an accommodation for the entire class um, because that can help with, you know, maybe make helping a student not feel like isolated or they're standing out in some way. But the thing is, like the accommodations that are being given for a lot of these neurodivergent kiddos are actually really helpful and beneficial for everybody. So I agree. Like, I don't think it's great for any kid to be sitting at a desk, sitting still for six to eight hours a day. Like that is not, especially, especially before the age of maybe eight or nine. I mean, just developmentally, like our brains and our bodies were not wired for that like we we need to be we learn by doing and so needing to kind of be out and moving around which is is great for the adhd brain a lot you know adhders tend to be very hands-on tend to be more um energetic and active and very um kinesthetic and so i've noticed a lot of the accommodations that will get put in place if they're implemented for the entire classroom then all of a sudden like all of the kids are doing better and all of the kids are happier. So, and that's not to, you know, that doesn't mean that this, that this child that has ADHD or that was diagnosed autistic, it doesn't mean that their needs are, are not different. Their needs are different. But I, but again, I think, you know, a lot of the things that we would consider to be accommodations, I'm like, maybe we need to adjust our educational (laughs) system. Um, right. At least in the United States, because you will see like in other countries, especially there's, there's lower rates of at least diagnosed ADHD and autism in other States that have less um, structure around the school day. Now, is that because there's really less autism and ADHD or is it because in this very structured, like box like setting, like ADHD and auti- ADHD and autistic kids tend to struggle more in those settings. And so if you're forced into that setting, your um, traits and characteristics and symptoms are going to be a lot more apparent than in a setting that's more conducive for the way that your brain works. Yeah. So um, you said you're neurodivergent. I know you have autism. Um, are you neurodivergent in other ways as well? So I'm self-diagnosed uh, autistic and okay. ADHD. 
which we could we could go on a whole uh, tangent about self diagnosis. I uh, I'm also an assessor, like I do testing for a living, so I have access to a lot of things yeah. that a psychologist would have access to um, as far as as far as assessment. So I feel very confident in my self assessment. Um, but yeah, and and again, it was maybe. Um, two, two, three years ago before I really like was putting the pieces together of like, oh, this is me. Yeah. Um, this is why. And, and then it, things started to fall into place. Like, oh, this is why I connect so well to these kids, to these people. I, um, this is why I feel like I can relate so well to them, but I didn't, it was with all of the experience and training that I had had and the exposure that I had had, I, I still did not see it. I missed it in myself for over three decades. So. Could you, yeah. could you dive into that a little bit? Like, I mean, being around it, you're, you're in the field where I, I would imagine most people will, would expect you to recognize it probably in yourself sooner. Um, like mm -hmm. most people would probably from the outside would be like, yeah, like if you're around it, and you're also, you also have it. Why, why wouldn't you realize that? But could you dive into that? Like what, yeah. what were the things that you started to notice? Um, like the specific things about yourself and maybe why you didn't pick up on it sooner? Sure. I'll, I'll start with maybe that last part, because I think the, the simple answer, I mean, it's, there's, it's more complex than this, but the simple answer for why I didn't pick up on it sooner and why many, uh, I have many adults come to me. I mean, I'm doing assessments for adults in their twenties, thirties, forties, fifties. Um, the, I had somebody recently that was in their seventies getting a diagnosis for the first time. That was really cool. A cool experience. Um, I think a large part of it for me is because of the way that I was trained and educated, I had a very boxed in limited view um, of what autism, what autism especially looked like, but mm. ADHD as well. I feel like ADHD, the ADHD train is a little bit further down the road than autism. Um, it still has a ways to go, but um, autism has a very long ways to go as far as like awareness and, um, and education and training around what that can look like. Um, but that was, I, I was stuck in the stereotypes. I, you know, um, I tended to work with, um, I could spot it. I would say in, um, in the kiddos, especially that were, I would say kind of medium to higher support needs, those who had maybe more stereotypical presentations, those who were more, um, the things that were more kind of overtly obvious, those that very openly stimmed a lot, or those who really had a, a very difficult time with eye contact, those who had a really hard time um, making and maintaining social relationships and friendships, um, you know, which which are all facets, can all be facets of autism and the autistic experience, but it's so much more layered and nuanced than that. And um it really wasn't until, um, uh, so it was maybe about a year into COVID. So I think, yeah, maybe like early 2021, what, when at that point, I mean, we had been, we had shut down our physical doors, brought everything down. I was doing telehealth and I was home all the time. Um, and I was with my husband 24 seven and he was noticing things about me when you're, you know, and we'd been at that point, we'd been married for, you know, over two years. Yeah. Um, but it's different to be in a relationship with somebody, even if you're, even if you live with somebody to go from living with somebody to being around somebody all the time, right. You just, you start to notice certain things about people. And there were some things that he just started noticing, um, and he knew that I worked with, um, you know, he's my my uh, co-owner of the business. And so he knows, you know, the, the population that I work with and things like that. He doesn't have a clinical role in the practice. Yeah. He's the business side. But he knows the population that I work with. And, you know, he would see, you know, certain characteristics and presentations of my clients and be like, you know, like, that's how you are, too, right? 
(laughs) And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, like you do this too. You know, you act this way too. He, he was picking up on me doing um, some stims that I had no idea I was even doing. And a stim and, is uh, like uh, any sort point. of like kind of fidget. So it, it, uh, uh, a stim can be like a body movement, right? Yeah, so to be uh, with your hands, with your feet, could call it fidgeting, stimming. Um, yeah. There can be vocal stims. So some people will use their voice to kind of make some sounds or things like that. It can be sometimes it's called a tick. Like people might have like certain things like like facial. Um, well, a tick is involuntary, but it can look that way um, for a stim as well. Um And generally, you know, generally autistic individuals are stimming. It can be sensory, like um, sensory regulating, sensory soothing, or it can be a way to release energy. It can be a way to focus and concentrate. Um, And and sometimes it's not even, again, like my husband was picking up on me doing things that I didn't even really realize that I was doing them, but they were kind of in there. It was like rhythmic in motion. And so um, there was that piece of it. and then once I really kind of opened my mind to that, I, I started doing a lot of research around it um, of like, okay, if I am like, I, cause I was like, no, there's no, there's no way that I'm autistic. No. And so I did a lot of research around it. Um, and that's where I found initially on Instagram, I found a, a pretty big neurodivergent advocacy community. A lot of people with lived experience. I found a lot of people with lived experience very similar to mine. And so I really did a deep dive because that's what I do. I I find something to get really interested in and I really do a deep dive in it. And the more that I researched around it, I really realized how much of the I realized how much of the boxes that I that I tick. Um, and so now now it feels very obvious to me. But I think, you know, you don't necessarily know to be looking for something if you don't know what you're looking for. Yeah. And I, it, it really took a lot for me to see such this like expanded view and not be for me to not be so rigid and how I viewed autism, even from, you know, looking at the diagnostic criteria of it. So I don't know if that fully answered your question or you have yeah. follow-ups on that, but. Um, I remember in your space a week ago, you talked about the identity Thing where where people who believe they have autism and you assess them and they they don't they kind of you didn't say identity crisis but it kind of sounded like mm-hmm. a little bit of a crisis there where it's like oh I've identified as autistic for a little while now and now I'm finding out I'm not I'm curious about that but I'm also kind of curious what are I've talked about this a little bit before with Dr. Whalen but at what point is somebody not like, because if, if it's a spectrum, what are the things that have to be present to even be considered on the spectrum at all? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think this, this actually, this goes in line a lot with like the self-diagnosis piece of it too, because I think some of the advocacy that I've seen, which I do uh, as a whole, I, I do really respect and appreciate the advocacy that's been done um, primarily on social media platforms um, of really putting the word out there, especially around like, hey, like this is what autism can look like. This is what ADHD can look like. It isn't just like ADHD is not just like this hyperactive, like little white boy, like bouncing off the walls. Yeah. <laughs> like ADHD has many different presentations. Autism is not just this out of control little white boy stimming in a corner who won't look at people who isn't who won't speak who doesn't have any friends right those are those yes autistic and ADHD people like that exist but that is not the be all and end all of what it looks like so i have really appreciated the expansion around that um but I think in, in the spectrum piece of it, it, it is tricky. It can be tricky, which is why I think that we need to be very, I have concern about getting rid of medical model language. I understand the concern around it. I understand that people don't like 
the words deficit or disorder because they do, they do have a very negative connotation, right? To tell yeah. somebody like, well, yeah, you have like you're deficient yeah. in something or you are disordered. But I, I would say, and I've told people this before, my brain feels very disordered to me a lot of the time. Like to me, I'm, a, I'm like, I would consider myself to have a disorder at some points in time. My brain is very disordered. My emotions can be very dysregulated and feel very disordered. And so I think if we go too far, if we stray too far away from identifying the differences, then we run into the narrative of, oh yeah, everyone's, everyone's a little autistic. Everyone's a little ADHD. Everyone's a little this. And that really dilutes the, um, the overarching, um, I would say like the overarching diagnosis. So yes, there are, while it is, does exist on a spectrum, there are very specific diagnostic criteria that do need to be met. And I do work very hard to stick to that within what I know around, um, you know, with the fluidity, because there is fluidity, there is nuance. It can look different in different genders. It can look different in uh, different, we have to take into context um, cultural upbringing. We need to take into context religious upbringing. There's so many systems that we're a part of that can influence the way that we present. So taking all of that into consideration. Um, but at the end of the day, yes, there are very, there are still diagnostic criteria that need to be met. Mm -hmm. um, what I have seen with like a lot of the social media stuff is, and where I have some concern around what's getting put out there and people doing the whole like self-diagnosis thing is that a lot of the stuff that's getting put out there is not really accurate. <laughs> so um, there are a lot of people, put, I mean, uh, social media, you can, I mean, for the most part, put out whatever you want, yeah. right? It's freedom of speech, as long as you're not like throwing out some slurs or hateful language. Although, I, you know, I don't know, some of that is let fly too. So, um, but really people can put out there whatever they want. And then what my biggest concern is that especially young people are then consuming that and then taking that on as, oh, this is, you know, if I, if I, you know, do X, Y, Z or think, you know, ABC, then I must be this. And so what's, what's happening then is a lot of young people in particular are self-diagnosing yeah. and then maybe at some point down the road, they go to get a formal assessment done and what they think are diagnostic criteria for whatever condition or whatever, you know, um, diagnosis that they were really looking for, those, those might not really be the diagnostic criteria. There might be something else that is going on. And so that is a problem. I have, you know, there's been a growing, and for that reason, there's actually been a growing number of psychologists who have just said, like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do testing for autism because I have people coming in and then they're coming in with an expectation of what the outcome is going to be. And if it's not the outcome that they were looking for, people get very, very upset. Um, and some people get very upset and very angry. And some people try to sue companies and things like that. So it can be, um, yeah, that it's a tough one. The spectrum thing is a really tough one to, to navigate because there's so much nuance to it, but there still needs to be, there are still defining lines. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the biggest challenges as, as a psychologist, as somebody who is um, a neurodivergent advocate, as somebody who is neurodivergent themselves, how do we, how do we like not blur the lines, but we still have the lines defined, but we don't have them be too rigid, right? Yeah. Because before they were too rigid and that was really limiting people's viewpoints. So yeah, I, you know, and I don't, I don't have a good answer to that. I think that's something that we need to continue to, I don't know. I, I think we can maybe kind of find that as we go. I mean, I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning every day and I'm doing, you know, my part, I'm doing what I can um, to try to, you know, put information out there to try to 
talk about my experience a little bit more openly um, because it it took a while for me to be more public and open with my experience. And and honestly, a lot of that was out of a fear of of judgment um, within like the, within my profession, because I knew that a lot of mental health providers, a lot of psychologists were not going to understand or were going to look at me differently if they yeah. knew that I had a neurodivergent label attached to me. So what are the what are the specific things that need to be present? Yeah. So um for autism, there is uh there's social communication differences. And um so that can look like a lot of that can look like a lot of different things. It's not necessarily specifically tied to language, mm-hmm. um, uh, like like language development, though that can be an aspect of it. But it's autistic individuals tend to relate differently to people than non autistic individuals do, and that can be um, a, that can be a, a there's a lot of examples within that, um, and that can be very nuanced, but there are generally social communication differences. So that could mean, um, you know, the way that I interact with somebody is different. Um, I might have challenges navigating friendships. Um, The way that I show up in conversation with others, how I'm speaking or what my body is doing or my facial expressions um, or how I come across to others that might be different. So um, for some autistic individuals, they don't have as much like kind of self-awareness around like our body in, in space. Um, So for me, I'm, you know, I'm not always fully aware of what my body is doing, what my face is doing, how I might be coming across to other people. Um, So that's an aspect of it. And then um, the, uh, the other criteria is really around a set of um, what I would call rig- rigidity. So rigidity or very restricted um, interests, behaviors. There's a, a big drive for consistency, sameness. So a lot of autistic individuals will have difficulty with transitions, for example. So transitioning from one either one activity to another or if there's like a change in plan, a change in routine, um, a change, you know, something unexpected. Autistic individuals tend to be very, uh, very restricted and very rigid in, uh, very black and white, I would say, like in thinking or expectations. Um, and again, this holds like a lot of nuance to it, yeah. right? Um, and I think it that that rigidity can show up in people without autism as well. So this is where it can be, you know, the lines aren't necessarily always super clear, um, but those are the the main hallmarks. So there's differences in social communication, and then there's a tendency towards more restricted behaviors or repetitive interests. So that could be having really um, passionate, specific interests in very specific things, um, but having, you know, having a drive for sameness, having a drive for routine, And that rigid kind of black and white thinking can be challenging for an autistic individual. For example, um, you know, if I'm an autistic kid in my classroom (laughs) and my schedule, I know what my schedule is every day. And then all of a sudden there's like a random fire drill or uh, there's going to be an assembly or my mom needs to pick me up early for, you know, an appointment or something like that. That's just, you know, some very like general examples, but any sort of thing where there would be like an unexpected change, or even if I knew that a change was going to be taking place, it's messing up like my routine, Mm. my schedule, um, which can create, can create a lot of anxiety for, um, for, for people because, if I know what the plan is, if I know what the schedule is, then I know how to kind of show up in those spaces. I know how to prepare myself for that. Yeah. If there's something that I'm not expecting or wasn't anticipating, or if I have to shift kind of how I show up, that's where some of that can be a challenge. So those are those are the core components for autism. There's a lot, again, a lot of nuance, a lot of spectrum within it but those are the the core components that I see. 
I've had a, I've had a couple people suggest that I might have autism be on the spectrum. And I'm after reading Dr. Whalen's book, I was like, I don't think so, but maybe like, so with people that are so, I don't, I don't want to use the wrong word, but like low on the spectrum, um, where it's like fairly minor, not too disruptive. Um, what's the benefit from being diagnosed? Sure. Yeah. So the the language that I tend to use and that most people prefer is support is like language around Mm -hmm. support needs, like level of support needs. So somebody um, that would be considered. So people oftentimes will use functioning labels like high functioning, low functioning. Um, So high functioning generally aligns with people with lower support needs. So essentially what that's meaning is people who are generally able to get through day-to-day life without a lot of, you know, accommodations or supports in place. Yeah. People tend to have an issue with functioning labels because, well, I think for a couple of different reasons. One is that they're very vague. So to say somebody is high functioning, um, I would be considered generally a, a high functioning autistic individual, but that really doesn't tell you a whole lot. And I would also say that from my own personal experience, that there are certain areas in life where I'm very high functioning. And then there are certain areas in life where I have a lot of challenges and a lot of struggles and would be considered maybe very low functioning. And that can really fluctuate even day to day. Um, So generally talking about like support needs, I think tends to be a little bit more a little bit more PC, but I think that that can be very nuanced too and and can be vague because to say somebody has low support needs, well, yeah, like low support needs though, like in what area? Like low support needs at work, low support needs in their communication, low support needs for being able to like take care of their personal hygiene or cook or take care of a family or things like that. But uh, the benefit of a diagnosis, so for if you're an adult and are generally have low or few or no support needs, um, benefit of seeking out a formal diagnosis. Honestly, the biggest reason why I have people come to me is just for kind of personal knowing. Mm. People who feel that you know, yes, like I, I've, I've self-identified, but I really feel like I need, I I need to know, I need Mm. to know this for myself. And, um, and I, and I really respect and, and support that, you know, for, for people. And I would say in the vast majority of cases, um, of people who I, who I have had come to me for that reason alone, the vast majority of the time I have, I have come out on the other end of that, giving them an autism diagnosis or, or ADHD if that's what they're seeking out. But I know we're kind of focusing a little bit more on the autism piece. Yeah. So um, it's really, yeah, for personal, for personal gain, personal knowledge, um, insight, especially if somebody's working through things in, you know, whether they're working through things in therapy or, you know, in, in their relationships, if they have a family. Um, sometimes, you know, as adults, you know, it can be beneficial to know if you're neurodivergent because maybe that will help, uh, you know, if, if you're one of your kids is struggling, maybe that would help you be able to better identify what's going on for your kiddo. Um, I also see the inverse happen where, you know, a, a child is struggling, parents take their kid in, get their kid assessed, kid comes away with an ADHD and autism diagnosis, and then the parents are there being like, huh, okay. This kind of sounds like me too. And then I'll have parents come and get assessed. And I have had that quite a lot of parents being like, my kid got diagnosed and I really resonate with like a lot of this. And now I'm wondering if I might be autistic, if I might have ADHD. But so, yeah, if you don't really need any sort of support needs or accommodation, it really, most of the time, it is just for kind of that personal gain and personal knowing, but that can obviously benefit you and it can benefit other people that you're in relationship with, right? It just gives a little bit more context to that for people. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, personally, I don't know. I've never been diagnosed, but I'm like, eh, I don't think it matters to me too much whether I'm diagnosed or not because I, 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 I am. I just am. <laughs> like, yeah, you I are can get by, you, you know. <laughs> but I know I do things like I stim constantly. Like my toes are always moving, and mm-hmm. like I roll my toes. My girlfriend uh, just a few days ago was like, "You always do that with your toes," and it kind of like I can make like a popping sound it's not my joint I'm actually like <laughs> rolling my toe and like kind of pushing it to the ground without lifting my toe and mm-hmm. uh she's like you're always making that noise and I'm like yeah, I know I know I, I don't mean to I just kind of do it unconsciously but uh yeah so it's kind of funny how little things uh you don't notice what you're doing and that's another thing is uh well normal I don't like I don't love the word normal because it's so hard to define. Like what's normal to you isn't necessarily normal generally, like isn't the average. And uh, do you find that people as they get older, maybe they've been masking certain things like communication is interesting because maybe you're able to adapt to how people are and adapt your communication style to people Mm -hmm. um, and deal with like, I don't like small talk. It's really boring to me. I get really bored. I want to walk away from a conversation if it's like about the weather and stuff like that. (laughs) But I think people, if the communication stuff isn't too prominent, uh, is it as people get older, it can it be hard to pick up on it because they've just kind of adapted to how society is. Yeah. I do think that that's a lot of it. Like, I mean, if you've, if you've gotten through your entire life without being diagnosed, chances are you're very high masking and Mm -hmm. have learned to, yeah, basically learned how to kind of show up in different spaces and around different people. And that may be consciously, but it may be really like subconscious, you know? So, um, I, you know, it wasn't really until I was reflecting on things through like the neurodivergent lens of really going back to my childhood of like picking up on how much I really watched other people and copied other people. Mm -hmm. And then to realize, oh, not, not everybody does that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do think that there's a lot of, there tends to be a lot of masking, camouflaging involved. Um, I think that Generally, in, in Western society, I see women be a lot higher masking than men, but it but that's certainly not exclusive to men either. But a lot of it has to do with how we're socialized yeah. and kind of what like the social norms and expectations are. It, it, as an adult, I mean, if you've gotten through and you're, you know, you're working, you have a career, you have a job, you have, you know, uh, coworkers, you have a boss or maybe you're a boss and you have employees. Um, I think there's, yeah, there's a lot of learning around kind of some of, especially like, like social scripting or yeah, learning just some of the, like, this is just how you talk to people or this is how you engage with people. So I think especially around the social communication aspect, I think that that can be a reason why, autism can be missed with a lot of people because a lot of autistic individuals mask really well and they can really, I would say like pass neurotypical. I would say, um, I mean, I at least, I at least think I'm pretty well passing. Like if people, I mean, I'm pretty open about my, uh, about my identities now, but if somebody didn't know that I was autistic, I don't know that it's super obvious in most situations, but if I'm going to be out in a, you know, in a very public situation or um, in a professional setting or something like that, I'm definitely going to show up very differently in those settings than I do just, you know, sitting in my living room with like my husband and my dogs and like hanging out and watching football. Right. So, um, yeah, I do think that that a lot of it does get fly under the radar because we learn how to we learn how to mask really well. Um, And then I think also what I will see is that as people come to realize that they're neurodivergent, 
then I start to see a lot of unmasking happening, Mm. which can sometimes then make it seem like traits or characteristics or symptoms are like getting quote unquote worse or are being more prominent. But it's really more about like to mask all the time is so exhausting. And once a person really realizes that that's what they've been doing the whole time, then it's kind of like once you know something, you can't unknow it. Mm, Yeah. So like now that I know, oh, I mask in these situations, it, it, it carries a different weight for me than I even realized. And now that, but now I know it and I can't unknow it. So I think that that's, I see that too, you know, where once somebody does have a diagnosis or does realize that that's what's going on for them, then sometimes those traits and characteristics become more prominent. It's not that they're getting quote unquote worse. Autism isn't like, it's not like a degenerative disease. Like it doesn't get worse over time, but I would say the expression of it can really um, vary. Um, And it can vary with age, but also vary with our, you know, our life circumstances, the demands put on our life, um, or even our day-to-day experiences and what we're going through. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Part of it makes me think of, do you know what photic sneeze reflex is? The what? Photic sneeze reflex. No, I've All never right. heard of that. So I have it. It's, I think about 25% of the population has it. It's uh, some people when they go outside and the reason I'm thinking of this is because People that have it just think it's normal. And people that don't have it, like now that I know what it is, if I mention it to people, they're like, what? Like, Mm -hmm. that's a thing. So if people that have it, if they go outside on a sunny day, they'll need to sneeze. Or if they're around Uh, bright lights, they'll need to sneeze. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's like this, you just can't. If I need to sneeze, if I feel a need to, like, I kind of want to sneeze or something, I just, go outside in the sun and I can sneeze. (laughs) But people that, people that have it, and I didn't realize it until I was reading like a, just a science book uh, in my twenties. And I was like, Oh, okay. This isn't just something everybody has. Yeah. And then when I started talking about it to people, it's like a lot of people, I'd either have somebody say, Oh yeah, I have that. I didn't know. I thought everyone had Mm -hmm. it. Or people would be like, I don't believe that's real or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it kind of reminds me of that in that you don't know what, I mean, we're all individuals and we really only have our own individual experience to um, kind of relate to unless we start asking questions and and see a clinician and, and have somebody tell us what you know diagnostic criteria it is Mm -hmm. or it's just kind of interesting how we we just don't have anything to compare to unless we ask those questions sure you know yeah and that really I mean I think that that actually describes like the autistic experience very well for those especially those who um who, who again like I'm talking about generally like lower support needs individuals who you you don't get a diagnosis until adulthood that it's that I get a lot of that same experience of like, oh, I just thought like, I just thought that it was like this for everybody Yeah. because a lot of it and a lot of it is very kind of like, like an, in, like your internal monologue or your internal thought process or like the way that you process information or the way that you visualize things. A lot of it's very internal. So like to just be like, yeah, this is just, I mean, like it just how my brain processes things. Like doesn't everybody's brain process it that way? So that I that's a very common thing that I'll have people say is like I thought that this was just something that like everybody experienced and then it wasn't until I said like XYZ to my friend or made a comment in passing that somebody was like wait what what are you talking about? Yeah. It's like no like doesn't your doesn't your brain do this thing too and it's like no. And so sometimes it really isn't until you have like another person's experience to kind of compare it to before you realize that like, oh, maybe this isn't just how everyone perceives the world. Maybe it isn't just, maybe it is not that it's just me, but like, 
maybe this isn't like something that everybody does. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you feel like with, uh, I, I feel like it's a little bit more common with ADHD, uh, the, the term ADHD being used. Um, some people that possibly don't even have ADHD will say, oh, I was, they'll almost use it as a, uh, an adjective. And mm-hmm. I feel like people do that with autism too. Mm-hmm. They're, they'll say, oh, I was uh, thinking more autistically about something mm-hmm. or I was being ADHD. Mm-hmm. And I've always kind of, it bugs me when people do that because it's like, this isn't something that you just have for a second and then <laughs> you go back to normal. It's, right. it's something that is just a part of your life. Do you feel like that kind of hurts the conversation in any way? I do. Uh, and I see the other, the other diagnosis that I see get thrown a lot, uh, that OCD. with is, is bipolar or oh, OCD bipolar. or yeah, yeah, OCD. OCD is a big one. Oh, yeah. I'm so OCD. Don't be so OCD or, yeah. or even like, Oh, the weather's so bipolar yeah. or something yeah. like that. Right. Like really kind of throwing around like a very specific, like a very specific neurotype because bipolar OCD, those are, those are different neurotypes. Right. Um, that yes, I think what I think it ends up doing, I think it dilutes. I think it dilutes the diagnosis. In my opinion, it dilutes how people perceive it. So, you know, yeah, people going around saying like, oh, this is so OCD or, oh man, like I was so ADHD. Then people kind of like house that diagnosis with that very specific behavior or that specific example. And then that tends to be, I think it just, it perpetuates a stereotype then of what that looks like, or then it makes it, or it dilutes the diagnosis. Right. So I, I can, I see it. I see both of those things happening. Um, but yeah, not, not a fan in Uh, in any regard (laughs) of that being used for, for any, for any diagnosis. Right. Unless you're somebody that like, Yes, like this legitimately. Yes, I am. I do. I have OCD. This is like, I am having an OCD moment. Like, yeah. okay, yes, you can talk about your lived experience. But yeah, to just kind of casually throw a label around with a, or, and label it with a very specific behavior or thought process, I, I find to be generally pretty hurtful. Yeah, and it, I, I actually have a kind of a problem with, uh, boundaries I've realized I don't know if that has to do with anything but I've just always kind of struggle with boundaries of like where does one thing end and then another begin like if mm-hmm. you look at my bookshelf I can separate my nonfiction and fiction pretty well mm-hmm. but then when it comes to actually separating I mean 90 percent of my bookshelf is nonfiction. so then when it comes to actually organizing those it's actually really hard to know where one thing ends and when another begins. And I have that in like tons of aspects of my life. And uh, I feel like when people use those words as adjectives, it kind of blurs those boundaries even mm-hmm. more, which is really frustrating because it's like, well, no, we're, we're talking about a, something that is diagnostic, not something that's an adjective, not something that goes away. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that I realize my brain can go all over the place. I can, <laughs> I can go from one thing to something completely different and somehow those are often related in some way, mm-hmm. but then I mean, one, a common thing I run into all the time is I'll, I write a lot of emails and I'll write an email and I'll stop mid email and I'll forget about that. email. I'll get mm-hmm. caught up in something else. <laughs> And I, it's like eight hours later, I'm like, I didn't finish that email. I didn't I send like, that email. Yeah. Oh, like all that the is, time. That resonates hard. <laughs> yeah, it's really yeah. hard. But um, you, you grew up in a, what was that? Fundamentalist Christian um, fellowship. And uh, yeah. later learned that it was more of a cult. And yes. uh, you said that it was... The ironic thing is it was kind of, I mean, cults are generally bad, but then there was some benefit to you, uh, Mm -hmm. the structure of it. Could you go into that and how it was beneficial? Yeah, I actually think um, because we were talking about kind of my my autism journey, 
I think that that was a, so a large part of why I didn't realize that I was autistic until much later in life was because of my um, involvement in being born and raised in this um, in this Christian fellowship. So, yeah, so I grew up. Um, it was a, a non-denominational Christian fellowship. Uh, yeah, born and raised in it. My parents both came um, into this fellowship when they were in their early to mid twenties. Um, looking for God, found God, found each other, had me, um, had my little sister. And I think that, um, so, so, and it, I was in this fellowship until it, um, it essentially imploded in its, on itself, um, about six years ago. Hmm. Um, so I would have been at the time, um, in my, in my early thirties, I would have been, I was, um, married to my husband, Josh, we had been married less than a year when like the church, the fellowship imploded in itself and collapsed. And there was a, a lot of factors and dynamics involved in that, that, um, I, I don't think are necessarily relevant for this conversation, but are definitely an interesting conversation to have. Yeah. If you ever want to have a conversation about cults in general, but yeah, I, I had mentioned to you in some of our, our chats, um, previously that, I think that a large part of why I didn't realize that I was autistic and why I actually, I, I didn't have a lot of struggles emerge until I would say like the last handful of years. And I believe that a big part of that is because the fellowship that I was brought up in was, I, I knew, I knew all the rules. It was very structured. It was very organized um, there were, I had built in friendships. So I, you know, I was, if you were to ask me, I would say, no, I, I, I never struggled with, with friendships, mm -hmm. but a large part of that is I grew up in a fellowship with people, my age, lots of people, my age, and we like had to hang out with each other. Yeah. So people kind of had to be my friend and I had to be other people's friend. Um, and that's not necessarily a dynamic that every kid has. So I always was surrounded by kids, kids my age. And I do think that that taught me a lot socially too. Like I learned how to interact and how to relate to a lot of different kids with a lot of different brains, um, a lot of different personalities, but the fellowship was very, I knew exactly what to expect, which worked, which works great for the autistic brain. Um, it was very structured. It was very rule-based. Um, autistic individuals tend to be very, um, very rule-based. We tend to have like a very strong sense of judgment and morality. So actually a lot of autistic individuals do sometimes gravitate toward more towards organized religion that has very like structured, like these are the rules. Mm. These are like, these are sins. These are things that are good. These are things that are bad. These are things that are evil. These are things that are holy, right? It was very, and I'm not speaking to, you know, whether like the goodness or badness of that, right? Because I think there's a lot of rigidity around that, that can be problematic. But I basically knew what the rules were. I knew how to act. I knew how to be a good kid. Um, I knew exactly what I needed to do to be a good little Christian. Um, and that really, that was great. I didn't have to figure any of that out on my own. I just followed the rules. I had the social support. I had the structure. Um, I had the um, we did a lot of activities together. There was, a, so there was always really something to do. So as far as kind of like that social interaction piece, I, I, I am, I do consider myself to be pretty social. Mm -hmm. I do lean more introverted than extroverted, especially now yeah. <laughs> as an adult, but, um, yeah, it, it worked really well for me. And I think that have it, when I lost that structure, so when the fellowship imploded, I didn't, I really didn't know what to do with myself. I mean, so much of my life was scheduled around, we're doing this event, we're doing this service, I'm going and helping with this. And a lot of the activities, they were very, 
I would say like more service based. So mm. I ended up, I, I learned how to cook. I learned how to make meals and that's what I did. Like I helped make a lot of the meals. So if we were going to be having a social event, like I would be in the kitchen making food, which also helped because I didn't have to <laughs> be out talking to a lot of people uh, or mingling, but I'd maybe be in like the food line and serving food to people. And I would talk to them then, but it was like a very limited interaction. And we're generally talking about the food. So all of that was very much structured for me. And so then when the fellowship imploded, I mean, I lost access to all of that. I didn't have my my schedule. I didn't have my routine. Um, all of the people that I would normally interact with that I thought were my friends, um, like I, it's, you know, it's been six years, the number of people in my fellowship that I still am in touch with and interact with is very, very few. And, but these were people like, I thought we were friends, but it was really more like, oh, well, maybe we were just friends by convenience mm. or right. Because we just happened to be doing, we had a common goal. I also think, you know, I walked away from that and I'm like, oh, I don't know how to maintain friendships because I never really, I never really had to, like, I just would see people at church. I never really had to put a lot of effort into like maintaining a relationship because I saw people all the time. So honestly, a lot of that is on me, you know, I realized too. So I, once all of that was stripped away from me, that was when I noticed and when Josh noticed like a lot more of the um, of the autism really kind of becoming more prominent. I lost all of my structure. I lost all of my cues, my my rules, my regulations around things. And I I felt really lost. And I realized how much of that had just been, yeah, really kind of sheltered and protected and guided by by this, you know, this this church fellowship that I was a part of. What is it, what does it look like? Well, first of all, is this fellowship at all intact anymore? Not, not really. I, um, so it was, it was a pretty, I guess it it wasn't like a mega church or anything like Mm -hmm. that. Um, but we had several, we had several different churches. So there was, you know, um, there was one in the Midwest, there were, you know, a couple in California, like kind of all across, like stuff spread across the United States and then a couple in other countries. So we had a couple of connections with fellowships in Mexico, in Brazil, in Israel. Um, and so I, at a certain point, I had to just for, for my own mental health, I, I just, I had to kind of cut myself off from all of it. Um, because the, the fallout of it, there were consequences there were some legal consequences that should have occurred that did not mm-hmm. occur um so the the main i would say like the main like the head pastor of the fellowship is kind of still like off doing his own thing and like has a podcast and moved like to a different state and there's still kind of something going is still operating under kind of a similar name, but is doing something a little bit different. Um, but for the most part, for the most part, no, I mean, there may be some like fringe stuff going on. Um, and some people still affiliated in some degree. I, I had to just, again, for my own mental health, kind of cut myself off from that. It became, it just became too much. I found myself getting sucked into like the drama of it. And I just, yeah, it was not for me. So. What were the aspects that uh, you now recognize as being more of a cult? And then what is an implosion, like it imploding? What does that actually look like? Yeah. Um, Well, it came down, my definite, then this is my experience. It came down to control. Hmm. I think that was the biggest thing that in my perspective now and looking back on it, I really recognize um, there I mean, really every, every aspect of our lives was controlled, which again, as an autistic individual who didn't know they were autistic for me, there was a lot about that, that I really liked because Mm -hmm. I was like, just tell me, like, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Like I do, cause I maybe don't know what to do otherwise. Um, but when there's that deep level of control that's involved it 
um, it eliminates the ability for people to think for themselves. And that's to me, ultimately what it comes down to is people willingly give up their free will. I believe everybody has free will and they willingly give it up and subject themselves to the will of another person to the point that they are taking on their thoughts, their beliefs without even, without even questioning it, Mm. just blindly trusting. Um, and I think that, um, you know, in my fellowship in particular, I, I do still to this day believe very strongly that the, the word was a very pure word sermon from God. I mean, there was, there were a lot of really to this day, very valuable lessons and experiences that I got out of it. I would say that the, the main pastor was very anointed in, in the word. But what happens and that I see in these more organized religions is that there just becomes, it it becomes too much man, like too much of like man's nature gets involved and we inherently strive for control. We strive for power. We strive for acknowledgement and recognition and it, you know, too much of man's hand gets involved in it. And, and that's just, you know, that is ultimately what I believe was was the demise. And the reason why I say that it was an implosion is because things really, the catalyst for it was there was, um, a member of, a member of the congregation, um, publicly came out with a, with an open letter and posted it everywhere, Mm -hmm. (laughs) posted it on Facebook, like it was very public, um, and talked very openly about their experiences with, um, with a lot of abuse that had happened to them specifically, um, which I won't go into the the details of for, you know, for the privacy of that person, even though they publicly put it out there, but it's their story. But that really was the catalyst for it. This person came out, other people, it was kind of like a Me Too movement. Other people started coming out, other people started, you know, questioning the authority. Um, And it really was ultimately the congregation of the fellowship that brought down, Mm. that brought down the fellowship. So, um, yeah, basically we destroyed ourselves. And, and and I would say very, very intentionally, the congregation very intentionally destroyed the the fellowship from the leadership, from yeah. the leadership down. You're you still consider yourself Christian, is that right? I do. And you know, and actually I think that this is maybe partially where my autism is beneficial for me too, and where it has helped me with this, because a lot of a lot of people that I know, um, a lot of my friends in this fellowship ha- had a really, really difficult time. And I had a lot of people that I knew that walked away from their relationship with God yeah. um, over this. For me, I think like my ability, I'm very, I can compartmentalize things. And for me, my relationship with God was always my relationship with God. And that never really, to me, had anything to do with going to church or helping prepare meals or, mm. you know, or, um, I mean, outside of, I mean, yes, going to a church service and, and worshiping God. Uh, sure. Absolutely. Like, I'm not saying that there wasn't any, you know, any connection, but I, I had my relationship with God outside of the four walls of the church all the time. I had it in my day-to-day life. And, and I, and I knew for me, I knew that God wasn't responsible for what happened in the fellowship. I saw that very clearly as it, there was corruption and man got greedy and man got perverted because that just is, in my opinion, like the just kind of natural instinct of man. I think that that's, yeah. I think that's why we need God in our lives personally. Um, but so, yeah, I, I do consider myself a Christian. Um, I, I feel very strong in my relationship with God. I don't feel the need at this point um, to go into any sort of organized religion, especially now, I think, knowing and realizing how much it really, um, it catered to my autism and it it helped support me in a lot of ways, but it also it resulted in controlling me and me not really ever learning how to think for myself. And so then when I was outside of that, I've really like struggled with that, like making decisions or trying to navigate through like, you know, a conflict with somebody or 
um, because I always, I always had somebody to ask about it. Like we had, we, they, we called them shepherds. Like we would go and talk to our shepherds about like, Hey, what do you think about this? You know, you know, and, and get their blessing on things. So I was always submitting everything to like a higher up and letting them give me an answer. No. So now not having that, I, I don't want to, I don't want to subject myself to that again, because I feel like, especially as an autistic individual, I know that I would be vulnerable to being very swayed by that because I, you know, just, I don't, I don't know what to do. So just tell me what to do. And I want to be able to think for myself and I want to be able to make decisions for myself and feel like I can trust myself. I think that was like such a big thing. Like I came out of that, not even feeling like I could trust myself. Um, so yeah, but yes, I do. I do still consider myself a Christian and have a good relationship with the Lord for sure. Um, so you and Josh were married before uh, mm -hmm. it it all imploded. Was that did that put strain on your marriage, or did it bring you guys closer together? Um, I I, I would say both. I mean, I think um, I would say both. It was very. We were very new into our marriage. We had been married less than a year. He has um he has two daughters from a previous marriage. Um, and they were, I think that was one of the hardest things because they were, um, young, young middle teens at the time. And they didn't really understand a lot of what was going on or why. And we were trying to be very protective of them and not wanting to expose them to things that they just, from a developmental level, just wasn't really appropriate for them. I would say that in some areas, like with, with our communication, for example, I think that it, it has made our communication a challenge over the last couple of years because we always had somebody, like we would maybe have an argument about something or a disagreement about something. And then we would go to our shepherds and be like, Hey, <laughs> like help us nap. I mean, mm -hmm. in some, a lot of ways it was kind of like counseling though. These were not certified professional counselors by any means, which was problematic. Um, so in, in many ways, but I think that was part, like that's been difficult of like really kind of trying, we have to really navigate through things ourselves, which, which we should be doing. Yeah. Um, but I think like, I would say like the lack of structure and then how that has impacted my neurodivergence, that has, I would say been the biggest strain on our relationship because we're trying to navigate that. I'm trying to navigate coming to terms with who I am. Um, that's been more, I would say, of a struggle than the fact that the church, you know, that the church imploded. But I would say, you know, it, it, in many ways, it has brought us closer together because we spent, again, I mean, we spent so much of our time in like these organized events and, um, and we would be there together, but oftentimes we were doing totally different things. And so, um, to be able, once the church shut down, I, we went very inward and we, we went really close to family. Mm. And so I will say that I think that, you know, having that opportunity and, and then to not feel guilty about just being with family and hanging out because we were made to feel guilty if you weren't at this event or hmm. volunteering or helping here or, you know, at this service or at this service or at this event, then people wouldn't necessarily say it directly, but it, you were looked down upon if you weren't at everything. Yeah. And so being able to just have our time be our time and have time to actually like have our relationship um, and have, you know, and, and be connected with our family, I think that it made us closer in that way. So. Yeah, it's really it's really been kind of a mixed bag, but overall, um, I am overall thankful for what was revealed, and I'm thankful to not be in that environment and in that situation anymore. Yeah. I wanted to ask you. Uh, this is more along the lines of autism, or it is along the lines of autism um, about music. I've uh, I like all kinds of music, but I do like electronic music and I've gone to like a lot of raves. I haven't lately, but 
I uh, developed a lot of friendships and acquaintanceships uh, with people who like electronic music. And somebody whose study was on the spectrum really likes uh, techno music, which is mm-hmm. more um, more repetitive. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's just there's not as much I don't know movement and variation in it, which annoys a lot of people with techno music. I'm not actually a huge fan of it. Um, have you noticed anything like that with people with autism, like uh, a a very sp- a more niche taste of music and mm-hmm. anything like that with music ever, like where you know techno specifically, it's really repetitive, not mm-hmm. much variation. Yeah, I don't. Um, it's interesting that you ask that because that actually is one of the. So I don't have a ton of experience around that, like personal experience around that, but it is. Um, there's a question on one of the diagnostic measures that I use that talks about. Um, uh, music like in repetition, mm-hmm. like like listening to the same song on repeat or liking the same, like the, a very specific type of music. I have some thoughts on it though. Um, Cause what you said, I'm like, oh yeah, that really kind of tracks. So I think part of it, yes, for some, um, like the repetitive nature of things, I think that that is from a sensory standpoint for some people can be very regulating and very very soothing. Yeah. I'm not a fan of techno, but I do like a lot of the repetitive um, binaural beats mm, yeah. that are kind of out there. And like, they, uh, they drive my husband crazy. He's <laughs> like, what are you listening to? So I'll, I just put my headphones in, which actually I think you're supposed to do it with headphones anyway, because it's like working with like the different parts of your, the different hemispheres of your brain and processing and different things. But um, so so there's that. Um, so the repet- repetition for autistic people is, is a big thing. There's um, like, there can be a sensory component to it. But I also would say that with sound in particular, autistic individuals are very senses based and sense and sensory focused. And so that can go one way or another. So we can have really strong um, sensory like sensitivities or aversions to certain sen- senses and sensory input, mm-hmm. but we can also have a really strong like attraction. Um, and, and, and for some people, it's not like of their senses, like it's not like every single sense or every single thing. Um, but I will say like noise for noise and sound for a lot of um, autistic individuals is, is one of the stronger sensory um, sensitivities that they have. So it can go from, you know, being very like averse or very reactive or having a very, being very overwhelmed or overstimulated by certain noises or sounds to really gravitating or seeking out certain noises, certain sounds, certain music to the, because it's just very regulating, like it regulates like your nervous system. Hmm. So it doesn't surprise me that you have an autistic friend that really appreciates that very specific type of music. Um, But I, and I would say, again, I don't know that it's like specific to music, but I would say in general, autistic individuals, like we just were more sensitive to sensory input. Yeah. Um, And that could be good. That could be bad. We can be attracted to something or repulsed by something. It's generally, we're generally not very much in between (laughs) with most things. We tend to be more like at one extreme or the other, kind of like how our thinking tends to be more black and white too. Yeah. Um, with you're in psychology and, uh, you're conservative, right? So yeah, with that, it's a very, very heavily left leaning profession in general. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's supposed to be apolitical, but, um, in our conversation, in our chats, you said it, that's not reality really. Could you dive into Mm -hmm. that a little bit? Because it's, well, first of all, like, it'd be, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts of why, because I've heard this before, like, it's very left-leaning. Um, and I have some thoughts why that could be, but mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'd be curious to hear why you think it is, maybe. And mm-hmm. then about not really being apolitical, I'd be interested in that, too. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um 
This is when, you know, uh, this is something like even maybe like six months, a year ago is not something I would have really talked about openly. And I think, and, and to me, I think that kind of speaks to, that speaks to a lot. Um, yeah, I've been, I, from, from a political religious standpoint, I've been in the minority in my field basically the entire time that I've been in it. And it really wasn't, um, you know, I know we were talking a little bit earlier, you know, before we were recording, I've seen a really, I didn't notice anything really significant that that was causing a really significant problem until maybe five to 10 years ago. Hmm. Um, Well, you know, actually it's probably been yeah, twenty. I think twenty sixteen. I think right, which would have been, um, yeah, during the during that election year yeah. is when I really started seeing things shift. Um, yeah, that would make sense because I was pretty newly. I mean, I I grew up. I grew up in Southern California, which is a. I mean, California is a very a, politically a very liberal state. Yeah. Um, I went to public schools my whole life. Um, I didn't. In, in fact, I mean, I was. I was in secular public schools my entire life, all the way up until grad school. Um, and my grad school program was a, a Christian program, but it was uh, open enrollment, which meant you didn't have to like sign a statement of faith or anything like that to to come into this program. It was very open. You could be whatever faith or um, religion or non religion that you that you adhered to. Mm. Um, but all of the professors had to sign a statement of faith. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was very used to being in the minority, but it, there was a shift that I saw start happening around 2016. And I would say really since, you know, 2019, 2020, I've just really, uh, the world is, our, our country is very divided right now. Um, psychology as a field is supposed to be by nature, it's supposed to be apolitical and non-religious. Um, and it's there for a very, those principles are there for a very specific reason, because when we're talking about providing psychology service, mental health service to people, that means all people, right? So um, everybody should feel like they have a voice like they are welcome, like they're not going to be judged. I mean, as a psychologist, as a mental health provider, it is my job, my job not to judge anybody who's walking into my office or into my virtual office. That's my job. Um, And I have seen, I've been very concerned with the shift towards much more um, left-leaning ideology and not even, and, and honestly, not even because I don't agree with left-leaning ideology because I, I don't agree with a lot of it. And, but, but that's what, whatever we have differences in perspectives and opinions. So it really isn't so much about that. I would have the same concern. Frankly, I would have the same concern if it was too right-leaning mm-hmm. as well, because then I'm like, no, now we're getting into this thing of like, it's not everybody is welcome. It's well, yes, we're saying everybody's welcome and there's no judgment, but we're out here making statements about this thing or this thing. So um, the American Psychological Association is one of you know the, the prominent um, psychology associations nationally. There's you know state associations and um, memberships and things like that. Um, but it's it's a big name. And so when you are a big organization and you're putting out statements that are political, that are leaning in one way or another, that does create bias in it. Um, And I have seen people who are more right-leaning because I'm I'm in the state of Iowa. I was a red state. It's Mm -hmm. pretty right-leaning aside from the big, the big cities are are pretty liberal. Um, But people will, people won't go to therapy or won't seek out mental health services because they are afraid of being judged or afraid of 
being viewed in a certain way or um, afraid of somebody trying to push their own beliefs or narrative or agenda onto them. Yeah. Which I, that makes me feel very sad that people are not, are afraid to seek out mental health services because they are going to be judged or they feel like somebody's going to push their own political or religious agenda onto them. So, um, you, you had asked about why, why I think that psychology has kind of led into like bled more into like left leaning ideology. Um, I think this is just my experience and my observation of it. Um, and I welcome debate around it too. But what I see a lot is I see a lot of um, emotion getting put out there. I feel like a lot of what I see being perpetuated in more left-leaning ideology, there's a, there's a very big emotional component to it. There's an emotional pull. Can we can we appeal to somebody's emotion? Can we appeal to their um, which isn't always a bad thing, yeah. right? Yeah. But psychology, what is psychology about? Psychology is all about emotions, yeah. right? And processing emotions and, and, you know, and, and setting boundaries and integrating our emotions with our, with our thoughts and our behaviors. And so I think there's a very strong appeal when things get very emotional or very dramatic that I think there's a natural propensity as a field because that's what we do. That's what we study to, to be very kind of attracted to that and to want to kind of latch on to that, go in that direction, you know, address that. And, and I don't think, um, and I, and I don't think the vast majority of mental health providers, I think are great people. There are definitely, you know, there's always going to be bad therapists, mm -hmm. but I think the vast majority of mental health providers are in the field for the right reasons. They want to do the right things. Um, and, um, and I don't frankly care what their religious or political views are, as long as they don't bring that into the therapy room. Yeah. Right. Because that's not what we're supposed to do. So, but that's just, yeah, kind of my thought on why I see things leaning a little bit more or a lot more over the last four, four years in particular, I see a lot of latching on to some of the more left-leaning ideology. And I think a lot of it does have to do with the emotional component to it. I could, I could see that. I think, uh, I think people that are, people that are more left-leaning or on the left, which I don't love the categories of left and right, to be honest, but mm -hmm. it's, it's too rigid, kind of, right? Just like yeah. we were talking about like, yeah. Yeah. With, with, with diagnosing too, it's, it's yeah. the same thing. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like, I mean, I mean, you touched on this, but the proper role of the left and right is to be debating, to be, uh, mm -hmm. to be, what's that word? Uh, I, I'm, I'm blanking on the word right now, but uh, compromising, compromising, Com to be mm -hmm. compromising with each other, to, to be having discussions, because I don't believe either left or right is actually correct um, inherently on anything. I think yeah, I um, there's different points in history and different parts of the world where uh, you can see the right having a stranglehold on politics, and it's like it can be very totalitarian. And same thing with the left. If the left becomes too becomes uh has a stranglehold on politics that can be mm -hmm. authoritarian as well just it, it manifests a little bit differently but yeah i see the the proper role of the two to be kind of having a conversation and that's where i actually worry with our politics right now is that it's more one personality politics and then two of mm -hmm. just like the other side is bad. Just stick with us. The other side is bad. And then it's like, mm -hmm. that, that's just not reality. And if you believe that it, it's kind of just turns you whatever side you're on. If, if that's kind of how you operate, it just, if all it takes is for you to be convinced that the other side is evil, 
then you tend to turn a blind eye to what your side is doing. Um, yeah. You tend not to worry about it too much because uh, you're fighting against evil. It's okay to turn a blind eye to, mm-hmm. you know, some cutting the corners on ethics and stuff like that when it, when, uh, mm-hmm. when you're fighting against evil. And yeah, that's when we get into like, like echo chambers, right? Yeah, like, and yeah. there's a lot of, I know that there's a lot of conversation around things like group think yeah. confirmation bias. And so, yeah, when you, when you polarize things so much of like, well, you're either on this side or this side. I mean, first of all, when you do that, you're alienating 50% of the country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, right. So if we're going to be very black and white with it and yeah, I think like everything then exists in in echo chambers and that's, you know, for me, um, mm, that's, you know, like that black and white, my brain thinks very much that way, but this is an area where I really see, I'm like, this is not good to be so black and white with this. We got to be, I agree. We need to be able and right. We should be able to have, um, debate respectful, appropriate, beneficial debate. We should be able to engage with people who think differently than we do. Yeah. Um, that's going to, that's going to make all of us better people. I want to know other people's thoughts and opinions. I want to know how they think because that's going to cause me to think critically too. Yeah. Not just if you're in an echo chamber and everyone believes the same things, you don't need to, there's never any need to explain or defend your beliefs, even to yourself. Yeah. Right. And I don't think that that's great to never question anything. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I feel, I mean, like you said, the, the left, left leaning people, I think you can find more, more empathetic people generally, people who think emotionally a little bit mm-hmm. more. And mm-hmm. that could be a good thing, but I, I also think it can turn into a bad thing if, if yeah. you're just leading with emotions constantly. But then on the right, you can see the same, the opposite, which can be really bad too. Like mm-hmm. you have somebody like Ben Shapiro, facts don't care about your feelings. I don't like that because it's like, sure, facts don't care about your feelings, but you as a person should care about people's feelings at least mm-hmm. a little bit. Like it should be factored in like, not everything boils down to just logical, okay, this, right. this, and this, and this, because like we are emotional creatures and that has to be factored in. And yeah. I'm like, I'm, if I take the political compass test, I'm very libertarian, not authoritarian at all. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, just, just left of center. And I tend to like understand arguments from both sides. Um, I've been a little bit more interested in some, I, I originally was very more left-leaning before. And I was like, I bought into the idea of like, Republicans are just bad. They're just, you know, they are racist or whatever, you know, whatever kind of cliche things you tend to hear. And Mm -hmm. I, I realized I kind of started picking that up in college because it just, it's mm-hmm. talked about so casually. I never really thought about it where it was like, mm-hmm. and then when I opened up a little bit, I started realizing, oh, there are some points that the right makes. I don't like Republican Democrat because I think the parties are just corporations that control our politics in general. But I, I think they're, the proper role is for there to be a real debate. When I started the podcast, I interviewed a clinical psychologist um, and we talked about trauma and stuff like that. And I can't remember the question I asked, but we talked a little bit about narcissism and he claimed that, uh, Trump is a malignant narcissist. And I found it interesting not to say it's, I think most politicians are narcissists actually, like I think, <laughs> yeah. I think Bush, Obama, Biden, and Trump, I think they're all narcissists. I'm not going to use the word malignant or anything like that. But I found it interesting that he said that because that's more of a diagnostic term. Mm -hmm. And when I walked away from that conversation, I was like, I thought to myself, that seems a little unethical for a clinical psychologist to use a diagnostic term for somebody that 
I understand Trump is in the media and we all see mm-hmm. it, right? But it's like, sure. you've never yeah. actually like assessed him assessed in a clinical setting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, is that, I mean, am I wrong there? Wouldn't that be kind of unethical to use as a clinical psychologist to use yeah. diagnostic terms for somebody you haven't assessed? I, I do. I do see that as unethical. And that is that is the problem that I have with the field of psychology sh- leaning away from being apolitical and non-religious. We are we are an example to the rest of society, to the rest of the country. And when we're in a place, especially in a place of authority, yeah. you know, people like I try to be very, I try to be very mindful and very careful about what I say. If I, and I, I've said even a couple of times on, on, you know, this recording with you, I'm like, this is just my personal perspective. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm not diagnosing anybody. I'm not giving advice. Um, I try to be very mindful of that. If I'm going to share a perspective of like, this is just my personal opinion, right? I think when we go into the line of, yes, whether that be throwing out like a label, I mean, yeah, calling somebody a narcissist to me has that same, what we were talking about earlier of like, oh, I'm so OCD. I'm so this, I'm so this. It's like, well, yeah, we're just throwing around a label now. And what is like, what are we really saying about it? Um, So yes, to kind of be openly diagnosing somebody. But again, like getting into, yeah, the political arena or using psych- psychological terminology to kind of talk about certain political figures or or uh, political leanings in general, I, I do have a concern with that. Yeah. You mentioned something about like the yeah the left being kind of more emotional the right being more analytical and it's it's definitely not quite as black and white but I, i would agree just generally with that what's really interesting to me about what you said is there's a um there's a principle within a um theoretical orientation of um of psychology called dialectical behavior therapy it's one of my favorite um my favorite kind of frameworks um and i i utilize a lot of the components in my Um, work with clients and try to implement it in my own life. But it talks about dialectics, meaning like, you know, uh, like wrestling with one thing over the other. And that, you know, the analytical side and the emotional side, a lot of times tend to be in like conflict with each other. They tend to fight against each other. Um, And there's, uh, you know, we talk about, um, so the emotion, we call it emotion mind. The analytical side, we call it a uh, logical mind and the blending of the two integrating of the two is wise mind hmm. it's like a venn diagram yeah. and so when you were talking about that in terms of politics i was like yeah that really makes sense and can we can we find like can we blend them <laughs> because there's elements of one there's elements of the other can we find a way to blend them which i think then that is you know where we can have like open conversations and debate that fosters that environment for what I would call wise mind. We're allowing access to all parts and able to, and it doesn't mean you walk away thinking like the other person. I don't even think that that's like the point of it really, but it's about, can I have a space where there's equal playing field? I'm able to see both sides and that we as a society would be a lot wiser. We would be in wise mind a lot more, yeah. I think, if we could find a way to do that politically. So. Yeah, I agree. I think because I'll, I'll hear people make an argument, let's say both sides. Um, I'll hear somebody make a more emotional argument. And when I hear that, I may not agree with the emotional argument, but I usually take something away of like, there is something I'm not catching here you know there's Mm -hmm. something i'm missing um in the way that i'm looking at this and i've also heard people who have very analytical and logical arguments and i catch like i'm like i i learned something from it but i'm i'll walk away being like there's something missing from that too like i i don't feel like either fully captures anything i just Mm -hmm. feel like there's a lot missing when those two sides, and I like how you said that that's really an 
all of us. We have that emotional mm-hmm. and we have the logical or the analytical. And I think we, I don't know, sometimes tend to accept one and reject the other. Like I'll, I'll hear one thing people that tend to be more right-leaning they'll kind of criticize people who are being emotional. They'll like write off people and like, oh, you're just being emotional. Mm -hmm. I've heard that in my life to me. Like, oh, you're just being emotional. It's like, maybe, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's completely wrong. doesn't mean it should just be dismissed. And I don't know. It's just kind of hard to balance. Yeah. But Yeah, I agree. um, There are studies that have come out over the recent years showing that there's a little bit more of a a little bit more prevalence with anxiety and depression among uh left-leaning people or liberal people and i'm wondering i have two things that i've been thinking about this one you've kind of touched on earlier where it maybe it's that right-leaning people aren't just aren't going to therapy because they some people have been alienated uh, because of institutions taking political stances. I'm wondering if that might be a reason. And then the other thing is, uh, like with the big five personality test, people high in openness tend to lean more left. And people mm-hmm. high in, I think the main one is conscientiousness. People who are just want to get to work and do the work and mm-hmm. do the job, those people tend to be more right-leaning. I wonder if that has something to do with it too, because uh, if you're high in openness, you want to create, and our society is not set up for creators in general. Like it's really Mm -hmm. hard to make a living creating anything, just using creativity to make a living can be hard. Uh, You tend to not succeed, uh, tend to not make the money. Like you can be successful as an artist, like creating, but making money from it is a very different thing. And then with conscientious people, as long as they're occupied, they tend not to be, they tend not to have too many emotional problems. Like that, that's kind of what gives them Mm -hmm. satisfaction. So I'm kind of wondering uh, your thoughts on that. Do you, like, do you think it might be just alienation or do you think what I'm touching on with the big five could potentially be part of it? Yeah, it's an interesting question. When um I guess like so my initial thought with it is that I think and I yeah, I did touch on this like the the emotion piece of it. I think that um left-leaning individuals tend to lead more with their hearts yeah. and right-leaning people tend to lead more with their heads. Now again, that's a a, a gross stereotype, right? So that's not I'm not saying it's it's not black and white. But I think that there is an element of when you're leading with your heart, there is an element of maybe being a little bit more, maybe a little bit more in tune with your emotions. But I also think that it, um, there's a a higher level of like sensitivity to like energy and like the, like the climate that's kind of going on around us. Like it's, I, I feel like those that are more emotional and leading more with their hearts, like absorb all of that energy. And it can create, I I think that that's a big reason why there's an increase in depression and anxiety. I think there's so much, and again, a lot of it, I think comes down to the divisiveness within our, within our country. But I mean, there's a lot of really tragic things happening going on around the world. There's a lot of war. There's a, there's a lot of division and a lot of, a lot of really concerning dangerous, scary things happening. And I think that um, those who lead with their hearts tend to be a lot more, they're very aware of the energy level. They're a lot more sensitive to it. And I think that it impacts them a lot more. Whereas those on the right maybe are, um, I mean, number one, I think maybe a little bit less in tune with their emotions, right? But also there's maybe more of like a, a filter or able being able to kind of process through things, not just like processing out the emotional piece of it, but not being so impacted Mm. by all of the emotionality and the drama and things that are going on. So I think that there's, 
kind of a, a, a mixture of all of that going on. And and again, this is just, I mean, I haven't studied this. I, I'm actually really curious about it. This would be fascinating research. I'm sure somebody's doing it somewhere. Yeah. I haven't done personal research on it, but I think that that would just be, that's kind of my gut feel with what I know about how our emotions work, how we tend to absorb information. And, and I will say, you know, I am one. So in, an interesting thing, I'm a little bit of a, like I'm a little bit of an oxymoron, like a little bit of a walking contradiction because I think, you know, where my where my political beliefs generally align, I, I would say in some ways, like I, I am much more, uh, in some aspects, I'm much more of a of a heart leaning person, mm-hmm. and I've and I feel things very deeply, and I'm very very sensitive, and I've been aware of that for I've been aware of that since before I even knew I was autistic. I knew that it was a highly sensitive person, and I've had to be very mindful around what I allow myself to consume, in terms of whether that be media, the news. Um, the energy that I am expending in like social interactions or hanging out on, you know, X spaces or yeah. things like that. Um, so I, I know firsthand that like, yes, it's very easy if you're more of an emotional person or you lead more with your emotions to absorb all of that. And that is like so overwhelming and so overstimulating. And I would be like, yeah, no wonder there's an increase in anxiety and depression. So that's yeah. just, yeah, some of my thoughts on that. Do you have any thoughts on how people could, I think when it comes to political conversations, there tends to be, and this is you know right and left, people tend to trick themselves into believing they understand the position or arguments of the other side more than they actually do. Mm -hmm. Um, Just to, I I don't know, maybe we like to feel like we're understanding everything, but we, we often don't, you know, like Mm -hmm. I I feel like a lot of people they'll say, Oh yeah, I understand their argument. It's just wrong. You know? Yeah. Is there, do you have any thoughts on like how people could, open themselves up to the opposing positions uh, more honestly? Well, I think that uh, the first word that comes to my mind is, is awareness. Like, are you even aware, right? Like, are, are you aware that you're making assumptions around things rather than like And making just like an assumption because of a a person's, you know, political viewpoint or their stance. Am I assuming I know what they're thinking or I know what their beliefs are or I know what they're going to say that I've just kind of already I've I've already basically decided what their narrative is and what their response is. And then I actually think then what ends up happening is we tune each other out. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) Um, And it's this whole I was talking about this actually earlier in in my space um, around around autism because it's relevant there too but the principle around listening to understand versus listening to respond if we would i think as a whole whether we're having a political debate or just having conversation in general if we could all work more towards listening to understand listening to like actually really hear what the other person has to say, like genuinely hear what they have to say versus I'm only listening to you because I are like, and I'm formulating a response in my mind and I'm going to use what you say to make my point or further my point. Um, I think that we would be in a better place just in general. I think our relationships would be better. Yeah. I think the the political divide would be less deep <laughs> if uh, if we could learn how to do that. And the thing is, is it's a that's a really basic principle. I mean, we learn like right, like how to like take turns yeah. and raise your hand and use I statements. Like we learned that. I mean, at least I did when I was in school, like, you know, basic kind of communication skills. 
But we tend to have a very hard time, especially when it's something that we put a lot of value, we have a lot of emotion wrapped up into it. Um, it, it means, you know, when we feel very strongly or very passionately about something, I think it can be very, very, very hard to sit in a space with somebody who thinks very inherently differently than we do. I think there's a, there is just kind of that natural propensity to want to respond, to want to defend. And I, I might say, I don't want to judge, like, I don't want to pathologize that. I think that's a very basic human response, but I would also say, can we be aware that that's what our response is? And can we take a pause and take a step back and really genuinely make an effort to listen to what the other person is saying? Yeah, I like that. I I mean, it's it's kind of what I'm trying to do with the podcast. I want to I want to listen to people. And I think it's funny because sometimes people, I've heard people talk about their voice. Oh, people tell me I have a radio voice. I should start a podcast. <laughs> and I hate the sound of my voice for the most part. Like I'm not a singer. I have never liked listening. I still don't like listening to the sound of my own voice in a recording or anything like that. But talking is not at all the most important part of what I try to do like mm-hmm. every conversation the most important and I'm not perfect at it by any means but the most important thing I'm doing is listening because I'll have some questions but if I if I was just thinking of questions the whole conversation it would be a shorter conversation not as deep and not as interesting because I would just I just feel like I would be brushing over what people say. And instead I try to listen and pick up on little things and like, Oh, okay, that's interesting. I want to dive more into Mm -hmm. that. So I think, I think in general, listening is so underrated as a skill. I think we all need to listen more. So I agree with you completely, but I've really enjoyed the conversation. I, uh, Dr. Christina, I, I love asking people about books that people enjoy, uh, that have Mm -hmm. influenced uh, them a lot. So are there any books that you've read throughout your life that are really meaningful to you? And maybe you think other people would benefit from reading them or would just enjoy them? It could be, it could be related to psychology or just, you know, (laughs) it could be a novel you like or whatever. Yeah. Um, well, my brain, my brain is very much in like nonfiction world, like over the last, you know, couple of, of decades, like since I've been really heavily immersed in school and education. So um, I would say uh, probably one of the most impactful books that I've read um, was uh, one that was given to me by my uh, dissertation chair, um, was also a professor of several of my classes in graduate school. And um, she gifted me uh, the gift of Imperfection by mm. Brene Brown. That's a really good book. <laughs> um, I need to circle back to that. It's been it's been a minute since I read it. Um, and I think you know I, I had a really I had a really interesting relationship with my dissertation chair, um, and it was it was a very challenging relationship in a lot of ways. But she gave me this book, and I was like. Oh, she really, she, she really sees me. She saw something, um, that I think I, in a struggle that I was having, because I do, I do tend to be very perfectionistic in my thinking. Um, and that was, and that was really fostered through a lot of my experiences. And I was praised for a lot of that when I was being really good or perfect or accomplishing things. So that, um, is one that I would say was was has probably had the most impact personally. Um, I really like um, the books that uh, Dr. Nicole Lapera has put out. Um, she's the also known as the holistic psychologist. Um, she's put out, I think, now three books. Um, but her original, "How to Do the Work," I really like um, that one. I think that there's, you know, her whole mentality is around self healing. Um, and, and learning how to kind of work through, um, and heal yourself, heal yourself from traumas, heal yourself from, um, you know, the, the patterns and habits that you create. 
she's not she's not anti therapy. She's she's a licensed psychologist herself. But I think really taking what I love about her approach is it gives the power back to you as the individual of like I have ownership over me. I can make a choice. I can choose to. Um, I can choose to do something differently. I can choose to break this cycle. I can choose to walk a different path. Not that that's easy, um, but I really like the approach that she takes with that. I think it gives a lot of empowerment and it also gives a lot of that self-accountability and responsibility back to people that I think is really important. Um, if you're gonna if you're gonna have any meaningful, lasting healing, you need to, I think you really need to you need to do it yourself. You can't have anybody else do that for you. Yeah. Um, and then from like more of like a, an integration standpoint, um, I, I have really gotten a lot out of the book, um, The Body Keeps the Score. Um, and I think what I like the most about that is really we, we've in the field, like in the medical field and in the field of psychology, we've done a really... I think we've really done the world a disservice by really separating out like what's going on in our body compared to what's going on in our emotions and in our mind when there's really such an integral link between the two and our body is giving us signals and cues around things that are relevant to experiences that we've had, traumas we've had, stressors we've had. So from more of kind of that like integration standpoint, because I, I like to think very holistically and very systemically, that's been one that I would, I would highly recommend that to any, to really anybody. I think just like realizing how we can't just separate like our body and our emotions and our mind, they're all linked. And I think that that's going to, if we can go about that in more of an integrated way within the mental health field and within the medical field, I think we're going to see a lot of shifts in a positive direction. So those are my books. <laughs> so, well, Dr. Christina, it's been amazing talking to you. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to hand it over to you to tell listeners where they can find you, where they can uh, find your website to work with you, books. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about any of the books that you're working on or anything like that, but anything you want to share go for it. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty active on X, uh, formerly Twitter. Uh, so my handle there is at Dr. Stai, doctor spelled out D O C T O R S T A I. Uh, so you can find me there. Um, I do have, uh, an Instagram, um, platform as well. Um, I'm at doctor.christina.stai there, doctor with a DR. Um, my, uh, and I'm, I'm not as active there anymore because X Twitter is so much more social and integrated. And I've, I've just really found a community there, but I do on occasion post stuff on Instagram. I'll actually post a lot of my X stuff on Instagram mm -hmm. as well, kind of double dip. Um, and, uh, uh, my practice website is a uh, holistic resources clinic.com. Um, I am licensed in the state of Iowa, so um, I am active. I'm pretty much always actively taking new testing referrals. Um, I am not currently taking any new therapy clients, um, but that um, will kind of shift over time as well. I'm just there's a big need for assessment services, so I'm really trying to focus on that. Um, if anyone is interested in um, learning a little bit more about my book that I have published. Um, it is available on Amazon. My book is called Don't Pass It On. Um, and it's available on Amazon in paperback or uh, um, as an ebook or as an audiobook. Um, if anybody who is listening to this podcast uh, would be interested in a copy of the book and you're located in the United States or in the UK, um, I can give you access to a promo code for the audiobook. So I can make that free and available to any listeners who are interested if you're in the US or UK. Um, and yeah, would really appreciate. I mean, that book was really fun for me to write. It was on my bucket list to be a published author. Um, I want it just to get out in the hands of as many people as possible. So if you do read it or listen to it. Um, I'd love, you know, your honest review and feedback on it. I'm, I'm always looking to improve, you know, my, you know, my skills and what I'm writing about. 
Um, the two books that I have in the works are both centered around autism because that's my brain is very much in the autism world these days. One is um, a book that I'm writing that's kind of more of a, a personal experience and um, talking about how to navigate and come to a place of ownership and acceptance around being um, diagnosed with autism, especially later in life as an adult. Um, the other one that I would like to put out there is going to be more geared towards psychologists, assessors, clinicians who are assessing for autism, because again, I think there's there's a big gap in um, in skill and education and training around being able to appropriately and properly diagnose um, individuals. Um, and I think, and, and we just, we need more assessors. And so my hope would be to be able to help be a part of facilitating the education and um, training around that. So those are both in the works as well. Awesome. Well, Dr. Christine, it's been amazing talking to you and thank you so much for your time. Yes. Thank you so much, Artie. I appreciate everything that you're doing and thank you so much for having me. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. It goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab, where you can find my Amazon affiliate store where I have brands that I personally use, and fractalzoo.net, which is where I have unique fractal-inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media, on X at RDTM Podcast and Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.